what I like of the Harry Potter thing is that there's really a relationship to issues. When I start working with Steve Club, it says, says, yes, okay, this is the fantasy world, but I, I'm more interested about, about this transition between childhood into teenage years. I have yeah. just done a film that was the transition between teenage years into adulthood. Mm. And said, this is interesting because it's 13, you know, mm. that that's that transition from childhood into, into the teenage mm. years, you know. Mm. So I was very interested about the themes in the film. Watching the time turner sequence unravel in Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban for the first time is one of the most exciting things imaginable. Like as soon as you hear this, you know, shit's about to get real. Quaron is such a master at his craft, you get so wrapped up in his storytelling you are blissfully unaware, but logistically speaking, it doesn't entirely make a whole lot of sense. Like, this confrontation here is clearly canonically longer than Harry and Hermione waiting for it to conclude, and if future Harry could see that Buckbeak was still alive from on top of the hill, surely the three of them earlier could tell my man was chopping a pumpkin and not a hippogriff's head off. But like I said, it doesn't matter, because it's just exhilarating to witness, culminating in what I believe to be the single greatest moment in the entire franchise. And I want to talk about what makes this moment so spectacular. But, but, but before that, we first gotta understand why the movie itself works so well too. Don't be getting so ahead of ourselves, you, you. You filthy little mob blood. This is where Harry Potter peaked. From the opening interview, its clear theme was central to Quran's entry into the franchise, and his decisions always made in service of thematic resonance. So because of this, let's examine the film from the perspective of its three main themes, them being isolation, adolescence, and fear all three being perfectly intertwined in some way or another, and as we'll find out, expertly crescendo to greater enhance the film's greatest scene. Fear might just be the film's biggest theme, no better presented in the now iconic scene of the bogger. For those unfamiliar, a bogger is a shape-shifting thing that takes the form of the onlooker's worst fear. Harry's at this particular point being a Dementor, this creepy-ass creature that feeds on happiness. His first encounter with a Dementor earlier on the train greatly impacted him, causing him to fall into a somewhat state of absentness, feeding into the greater idea of the Dementors representing depression. Harry's fear begins to consume what he loves and generate anxiety from where it'll surface next. The Dementors are in part the catalyst for helping set the new, darker tone of the film and then rest of the series, with Quaron's flowing camera work helping match this perfectly complementing their spectral, somewhat ethereal presence and movement, and thus generating a greater sense of unease throughout. There are also instances where Quaron examines the scene from the perspective of fear itself, further heightening and instilling this darker atmosphere, as well as visualising how, for Harry, he seemingly cannot escape his fear or despair. But as is presented in the Boggart scene, one of the film's many lessons is of how to overcome this. If only at a certain point, Harry will understand he has the strength to do so. Hint, hint. I don't have to regurgitate just how incredibly Quaron visually captures Harry's feelings of isolation here. The Prisoner of Azkaban reflects, deepens, and foreshadows these feelings by separating Harry out from his surroundings or else placing him apart from those around him. Whether it means separating Harry from his friends in a shot about something else, telling Emma Watson to kneel out of a shot. The framing all around is top tier, but where does this isolation come from? Obviously from being the chosen one, the confusion of this title and whole new world and legacy thrust upon him at a young age, but also from grief. Although grief is a recurrent theme in the entire franchise, in a way, this film explores each facet of the idea of its five stages, speaking to this film feeling much more self-contained than the others. We see Harry's anger in this resentment he feels for never being able to get to know his parents or the way he believes them to have been treated, built up through every permission slip he can never get signed or the long list of memories he never got to make. Bargaining naturally follows this stage as Harry develops dangerous thoughts of harm onto those he perceives as having betrayed his parents, which will lead to further isolation from those around him. And then we spoke about depression when looking at how fear is presented, understanding it follows Harry everywhere over the course of the film. Now, denial is viewed typically as the first stage of grief, but is beautifully and specifically presented during the climax of the lake sequence told from Harry and Sirius's point of view, and their close encounter with Dementors before being saved by a mysterious Patronus. The Patronus charm is an extremely difficult and powerful spell, a projection of happiness primarily used to drive off Dementors, and when Harry sees this at first, he interprets it as his father saving them both. Over the course of the runtime and franchise as a whole, Harry's constantly compared to his parents or their presence frequently brought up around him, to which it's almost as if they are still alive, but Harry just out of reach, like their image literally moves within photographs. Therefore, we cannot blame Harry for how desperately he wants to believe that this is his father saving them. 
this seemingly never-ending state of solitude he's confined himself to, and his only glimpse of hope, the impossibility of his parents coming back, giving in to denial. But luckily, acceptance is right up ahead. If only at a certain point he'll learn how to use his isolation, and that hope doesn't have to come from a place of fantasy. Hint hint. Prisoner of Azkaban absolutely captures the idea of Harry beginning to come more into his own as he transitions into his teenage years. Whether that's through dressing him more in his own clothes than his Hogwarts uniform, showcasing his becoming slight rebellious edge by using magic outside of school or defying authority, but also adding to the idea of him repeatedly looking for guidance, attempting to fill his parents' empty space. He's trying to discover who he is and what he wants to do. He's a character constantly confused and one who often succumbs to his own self-doubt. Even after all he accomplishes in the film, in a conversation with Lupin near the end, Lupin the best character by the way, we see he still believes what he achieved didn't make any difference. However, as an audience, even prior to the time turner sequence, his mischievous antics prove to us that he is capable and he is strong, but he just doesn't believe it himself, letting his fear and isolation get the better of him. He's beginning to, and in a way forced to mature. If only at a certain point, he'll truly use all the guidance he's been given, and start to believe in himself. Hint hint. So now that brings us to this. Serious. Come on. I just have to reiterate how beautiful this movie not only looks, but also sounds. The sound design of the Dementors engulfing the skies, the lake, and all around them, enhanced by John Williams' totally enchanting score. Not only that, but the icy breath in the frozen lake, harkening back to Harry's first encounter with the Dementor emphasizing this bleak, stark atmosphere they create around them, removing any ounce of warmth or comfort as Sirius' literal soul is getting sucked out of him. At first, Harry is blinded by this notion of his father coming to save them. He needs to believe this because he isn't strong enough. He's just a scared little kid, and he wants so desperately to believe it, because all he desires most in this world are for his parents to be there. Then all this loneliness he feels would drift away, right? But as Hermione states, Harry, listen to me. No one's coming. At an earlier point in his life, Harry may have let these words get the better of him, but as he comes to understand the reality of what's in front of him, Sirius dying in his own arms, in an empty space, this fantasy finally fades away, as he realises, the only person that can truly save him, is himself. And so... Expecto Patronum! God, this moment is so fucking good. It's Harry discovering for himself that he has the ability of a truly powerful wizard, but it also represents so much more than that. He's confronting his fear head on. He's stepping up into this next chapter of his life, compelled to grow up so quickly, but embracing the isolating position he's been bound to. He can be the one in control of his life and emotions, but first has to recognize that he has the strength to do so, because his parents won't be there. But as Sirius states, the ones that love us never really leave us. That was his father's Patronus he saw before him, because his parents' spirit will always be a part of him. But now he understands that he must come into his own. Light is one of the many recurring motifs throughout the film, and as Harry casts away every last Dementor, I'm reminded of a quote. Happiness can be found even in the darkest of times, if one only remembers to turn on the light. Right under our noses, everything in the movie had been building up to this, and that is the magic of the movies, baby. That was cringe, but great movie. Uh, and they sent me Harry Potter, and I haven't seen Harry Potter, read Harry Potter or anything, but I just said, okay, this is ridiculous. <laughs> and I was making fun of it. Guillermo del Toro called me and says, what is, what's happening? He says, well, they, can you believe me? They offer me this Harry Potter thing. I was laughing. And he says, have you read it? says, no. He says, well, you're a fucking arrogant asshole. <laughs> <laughs> Skadoosh.